Good evening. I'm Father Jeff Hahnemann, the priest in charge of the Episcopal Church of St. John's in Washington, Connecticut. And this is a fireside chat. A production of St. John's is part of our online outreach to our parishioners and friends in this time of pandemic and self-quarantine, and made possible with the support of viewers like you. Tonight, worship in the wintry days ahead. As you all probably remember, with the recommendation of the bishops and the Standing Committee of the Episcopal Church in Connecticut, all parishes were advised in mid-March to close to help mitigate the spread of the COVID-19 virus around the country and especially in the greater metropolitan, New York metropolitan area. The health and the safety of our community was and remains our principal and primary concern. We want to follow the gospel command to love our neighbor as ourselves. So at St. John's we heeded the recommendations of the bishop and the standing committee and our governor to suspend all non-essential public events to aid in preventing the spread of the disease. Most parishes, but not all, quickly figured out some way to continue to have their services and they get those services online for their parishioners. Many simply recorded them and then posted them to their parish web pages or online Facebook or YouTube. Those were the two primary avenues uh, to live stream as well or else to use Zoom. Many parishes chose Zoom, which was a new technology to me. Uh, we began to use it for our meetings, but not our services. Zoom services allowed for more participation by others uh, who could Zoom in from their homes to read a lesson, lead the prayers, make announcements, sing a solo. And those parishes with audio equipment and software and skills could edit individual performances of their choir members into a choral production, which were quite impressive at times. The Zoom services did require everyone to be online at the same time. Others could watch it recorded later, but wouldn't appear there visibly. I got the feeling that our parishioners enjoyed our online services being available whenever they wanted to watch them, um, and watching them at home in their, in their bathrobes rather than on a Zoom box. Um, so I refrained from Zoom, because it was new to me um, for Sunday morning worship, because I also thought that we were only going to be closed for a couple of weeks and then we would go back to having in-person worship. But I also assumed that whatever we did online would be popular enough and useful enough to especially uh, those who were uh, concerned about catching the virus, who would stay home, they could participate and watch. And therefore I thought um, Facebook Live would be easier. Um, I imagine that many of our, our parishioners who are weekenders would love to have the option of uh, participating in the service on weekends when they did not or could not come out to Washington. So Facebook was, was the easiest option for me. We, we already had a, a, a page that was active and all I needed was my cell phone and a tripod which I quickly purchased and it worked out pretty well. By the second weekend, within 10 days of, of the order from the standing committee, we were up online. Um, we had adjusted to a single service on Sunday, and a service that though the church was closed, we had five or less participants uh, in the church in accordance with the governor's recommendations. We had uh, John playing the organ, Marguerite and Donna singing, I celebrated, and on occasion my wife served as lector. Many other clergy led the service on Zoom or Facebook from their home or their offices or alone in the church. I chose the live stream from the interior of the church rather than my office or my home staying home in Kent because I thought the visual of the Raridos of St. John's uh, would be comforting to the viewers and that they would enjoy hearing the organ play, um, hearing the bell toll hearing the familiar voices of, of Donna and Marguerite as they sang. At that time, many parishes began doing morning prayer rather than Eucharist, um, suggesting that since the vast majority of their parishioners couldn't be there and couldn't communicate, what other option was there? Some continued to celebrate Holy Communion every Sunday in the church. Some continued to celebrate it from home or from their offices. 
The prayer book commends the Holy Eucharist as the principal service on Sunday, because Christians have been doing that for as long as we know. Starting from that first Easter Sunday, Sunday afternoon, when, uh, when Jesus appeared to the disciples as they were having dinner, only Thomas was missing. And then again, a week later on Sunday, Jesus appeared to them again. And so began the tradition of gathering for a meal and remembering Jesus or feeling Christ's presence among us on Sundays, which goes back to the earliest days of the church. Now, there's always been a rubric in the prayer book usually in the services to the sick or in last rites, that allowed those who could not physically receive Holy Communion because of things like tubes down their throats, that when the priest brought them communion in the hospital or at home, they would be reassured that they receive the spiritual blessings of communion even though they can't physically take the wafer. There have been numerous prayers over the years uh, for spiritual communion to reassure and reaffirm uh, this to the faithful. Now, like others then, we at St. John's began to practice spiritual communion. We celebrated the Eucharist as we have always done on Sunday mornings at the same time in the same place. But we didn't receive communion. Uh, those who were present decided in solidarity with the many others who could not be there uh, to receive that we wouldn't receive either. Um, as a sense of, of, of concern or empathy uh, with those who are having to watch it online. Some parishes, I know, allowed the small coterie of people who would organize in services to receive, and some I know, some priests I know, at least they received, uh, which struck me as rather clerical at the time. Uh, I preferred the solidarity of us all suffering from the absence of communion together, and it's still somewhat shocking to me that I've not received communion since mid-August, that I've gone through Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Easter, Pentecost, and not received. I'm not sure what we'll do in the future as, as Holy Communion becomes available again, especially when the vast majority, or at least the majority of our parishioners will be watching from home and won't be able to receive, whether that will feel right to receive Communion while they cannot. We'll see. As the weeks passed, of course, we learned more and more about the coronavirus and the transmission of the disease. Masks became an essential tool to mitigate its spread, and if you watch our services from the very beginning, you'll start to see masks appear, uh, to stay on longer, um, for everything but the singing by the end. Um, because there were dangers of unmasked singing in a great number of studies and articles that went around at the time. And I began to get anxious that Donna and Marguerite were singing unmasked in the church, but though there were only five of us there, there was some endangerment to the other participants. Um, later I said I felt safer with the in-person worship that we began in, I think, late June uh, than I did in the times when we had unmasked singing. Protocols were talked about greatly and developed, and uh, Vestry can assure you that I sent them copies of what we got from the CDC or from the, the bishops and staff or from various other groups, including the Wisconsin Council of Churches, uh, as we discussed uh, what we should do, what was possible, what was tolerable. And so as soon as we were able, I reinstituted in-person worship at St. John's in accordance with the protocols, protocols which did indeed eliminate congregational singing, allowed for only unmasked soloist, a single singer, at least 30 feet away from the nearest parishioner. Uh, thank goodness we had a side chapel where that's possible. Uh, many churches did not have that option. This was when the governor instituted phase two that began to expand uh, uh, numbers at public events and allow some non-essential public events to go on. And that's when we began having in-person worship again. Many, if not most, of the Episcopal churches in the, in the, in the state of Connecticut have not moved to in-person, inside worship yet. Um, we previously experimented during the summer with pre-recorded music as we knew that congregational singing would be forbidden, um, but the, the, the pre-recorded music was generally panned. We also experimented with morning prayer during my staycation in August. Um, there were people who said they were ready to come back to church, and I felt that as soon as the governor allowed it and protocols were in place, that I had an obligation to allow parishioners to come back if they wanted so. Uh, 
they followed the protocols. There's been no resistance to those. I've been rather proud of their willingness to do so. Um, in other churches, there was sometimes angry pressure to get back to in-person worship, um, which we, thank God, did not have. Uh, most Episcopal con congregations, uh, if they returned to in-person worship, uh, returned to it outside. Those who had been using Zoom all this time were now struggling to make adjustments um, to return to church. You can't do a Zoom service in the church, not that I've seen. And so they began moving to live streaming, having to organize Wi-Fi, for instance. I know St. John's in New Milford is having to put in Wi-Fi so they can continue uh, uh, streaming their services for their parishioners. So even with in-person worship, outdoor is preferable to indoors. Uh, and many congregations are now hosting in-person outdoor services uh, on the lawn, uh, in the parking lot, uh, at an outside altar or public park or gazebo. Um, some have organized drive-in services. Um, I considered both um, during this time, worshiping, uh, doing a drive-in service in our parking lot or worshiping on a lawn somewhere. Um, but I struggled with the technical setup uh, that to continue live streaming and being able to receive a Wi-Fi signal uh, for the vast majority of Christians who were going, I know were going to watch online. And I imagined again, perhaps wrongly, that Christians would be pleased to see the familiar church in the background, to hear the organ and the tolling of the bells. So if indoors, there were recommendations as to what people could do to make it safer one of which was to open all the windows and all the doors to allow natural air circulation, not to use ceiling fans or standing fans, uh, which meant it was a bit hot in the church during August, um, and a lot of the windows at St. John's don't open. Um, so there is some anxiety about the circulation of the air in our indoor space, even with the doors and windows open. Winter will be more challenging. Meanwhile, the bishops and staff have began and have now produced protocols for an eventual return for Holy Communion. Shared with our vestry, talked about in the executive committee, it includes things like uh, recommending that people stand to receive, uh, that they receive the bread only and not the wine, that they form a long line down the center of the church standing six feet apart, uh, that they might receive a pre-wrapped wafer, individually wrapped, uh, that was then consumed off to the side, with only the priest entering in the sanctuary area around the altar, which is distressed the, the deacons who are used to setting the table. Um, and all of these protocols were developed with the idea that when the governor moved to phase three, um, we would then encourage or allow communion to return. But the governor has on several occasions now delayed phase three, so we're not there yet. We were getting ready for it. We will work out a protocol that works for us in the days ahead that feels safe with the flexibility to see what works, what feels comfortable, what does not. Um, be assured that we will continue, however, online streaming. In fact, the parish has recently approved moving forward with a built-in camera for future live streaming from the same company that installed St. John's audio uh, system. The camera will probably be located over the front door, on the, uh, above the door. Um, it will be able to zoom and pivot. Uh, we've checked comparable installations uh, of this camera at Temple Bethel in West Hartford and the Trinity Chapel at Trinity College, and we're impressed with the optical zoom capabilities, not like the Mevo camera, which digitally zoomed it, but it got pixelated the more you zoomed. This is a, a real optical zoom. Uh, the camera would be directly connected to our audio system, so there's no anxiety about additional microphones and not being able to hear or being able to hear things like the fan. Um, the camera would be directly connected to the router in the sacristy, so there would be no concern about Wi-Fi and keeping a signal. The camera would be electrically wired in, so there would be no concern about batteries and overheating. Now, there's a bit of delay of installing this because there's a back order of cameras and a back order of installations, but we hope to have it in place by Thanksgiving. So as we move forward, as we begin to anticipate going back to Holy Communion sometime this autumn or winter, here are some general principles that were provided to the House of Bishops.
by Dr. Fauci himself. Three things seem to be effective in the spread of the virus, namely universal masks, physical distancing, and that outdoors is safer than indoors. And I'm glad to report that there's been no resistance to these protocols at St. John's. Um, at St. John's we have protocols that include a temperature check as you come in, uh, mandatory masks, physical spacing in the pews, a contactless offertory, no congregational singing, and a recording of the attendees at a service in case of need for future contact tracing. And the people who have come have said that they felt very safe and comfortable. Uh, as more and more of them come, um, it's clear that we are slowly returning back to in-person worship. I've noticed the last two weeks, particularly, that after the service, people have lingered longer, talking to one another. The first few weeks, the service was over. By the time I came out of the sacristy, everybody was gone. Uh, there's a lot more uh, comfort level uh, now than there was before. Dr. Fauci also told the bishops that when the experts talk about crowds, they mean congregating close together. Large groups outdoors and spaced out properly is safer than small groups in close quarters. For those worshiping outdoors, there are future considerations to be had once the weather uh, is colder. So those churches that moved from their Zoom services to outdoor worship are now struggling with what are they going to do next. The governor has recommended strict limits to the size of indoor gatherings, uh, limited to 25% of the church capacity in phase two, which we're in now, uh, with a maximum of 100, and, uh, or whichever is smaller, 25% capacity or 100, and a maximum of 150 people for outside worship. And that's been a bit of a hardship for some of our bigger parishes. In, in phase three, the indoor limit will rise to 50% occupancy. St. John's has 10 pews, not counting the two at the back, uh, which are sort of half pews. Uh, each pew can easily hold five people comfortably, so that we have a capacity of about 150. A 25% occupancy in the current phase two uh, configuration would be about 35 persons, and that's far more than we're getting now. That's, we're getting maybe half that on a good Sunday. And a 50% occupancy in phase three would be about 75 individuals, which is more than we were getting on the average Sunday in the time before the pandemic. So we are blessed to have a church and a congregation that fit these guidelines. Some of the smaller buildings with larger congregations are really struggling right now. Um, I know of several that had to add services and reservations in order to keep the capacity at its limits and to accommodate all the parishioners who want to return for in-person worship. I imagine that reservations may be something we will have to do for Christmas Eve when we will lim be limited, presumably, to only 75 in attendance. We'll cross that bridge when we get closer to it. So in our current conservative configuration, and we really did stretch out the pews, St. John's has seating for about 10 to 12 households, spatially distant, which can accommodate 20 to 25 people, which is double what the capacity that we need at the moment. Uh, we're getting a little more than half of that. So there's room to grow even under the existing phase two protocols. We can in the future re reconfigure the pew seating to accommodate twice that number. So we're okay. We can continue to do in-person worship, meeting the protocols recommended by the Episcopal Church in Connecticut, by the CDC, by Dr. Fauci. Um, unfortunately, there are still recommendations of no coffee hours no in-person social gatherings, especially where they would have to lower their masks, um, even in phase three. Dr. Fauci also recommended that to the bishops that singing is worse than speaking. Singing sends out more particles, more forcefully uh, as the voice is cast, and, and this virus is aerosoled, um, and it's been tested by, by scientists. So it's recommended no congregational singing. Fauci also noted that masks are preferable to face shields um, as the aerosolized particles can uh, fall down uh, a face shield or be assumed up. Uh, there is also a misperception, Dr. Fauci said, in the public sphere that it is an all or nothing uh, kind of total shutdown or total ignoring of the precautions and that this was not an accurate perception of what is possible or what is recommended. 
there's still a lot that we can do to simply be in a safe manner. And we should do what we can, even if we're not comfortable with everything. Public health recommendations and the science based on it can be seen as a gateway for accomplishing a task and not as an obstacle that locks us in. However, winter will be problematic and we're not sure what we will do. If you gather indoors, you are told to do so with windows open, temperature and humidity levels turned up higher, Dr. Fauci said, because heat and humidity cause the particles to fall to the ground faster. Many churches now, and we have a weekly conversation with the bishops where you can catch a sense of what churches are doing, many of them now are checking their air circulation systems and the filters that are in place or could be in place. But churches that are heated by radiators, such as St. John's, do not have that option. And we are somewhat challenged in what we do indoors. One suggestion has been to turn the heat up and leave the windows and doors open, even in winter. I know some churches are assuming that parishioners will wear their jackets to church and keep them on as the temperature, uh, um, as the churches get cold because of, of open windows and open doors. Um, I'm not sure what we will do when we return to in-person worship at St. John's, but we will do that sometime in the days ahead, and we will certainly continue to live stream. And we will struggle to make the experience as safe and as comfortable and efficacious as possible. However, if there is a spike in contagions this autumn, a so-called second wave resulting from the schools opening or from the flu season, there is the possibility that St. John's may close its doors again to public worship for some time this winter. We'll see. But be assured that even if that happens, I will be there on Sunday mornings to celebrate the Eucharist at the usual time, in the usual place. Uh, church will continue to go on as we did when we were shut down before, because church is more than worship. It is our care and concern for our neighbors, for our community, for our friends, things like the blood drive or the, or the hosting of the farmer's market or the food drives or the Bible study or Christian fellowship or our discussion of, of racial injustice and the reading of books or the inviting of speakers. Church will go on. Church is not just what we do on Sunday mornings. Church is not the building, which may be closed again. Church is the people. I care for the, the orphans and the widows, the poor, the unemployed now, the gig workers, the hungry, the sick, uh, the hospital workers and first responders. But finally know that this pandemic will end. Yes, it may be next summer before it ends, before the vaccines have been tested and widely distributed. But it will end. It will not go on forever. So please don't lose hope. And don't stop being the church. Um, don't stop being Christ's body, Christ's hands and his heart in our world, in our community, because our world and our community need that presence now more than ever. Amen. Keep the faith. Good night, and God bless.